sovereign God, we pause in this moment to say thank you. Thank you for your blessing and your love and your healing power upon us. Thank you for grace and mercy that accompanies our journey. And now we pray that you may speak to us, that you may cause us to hear, understand, and live as your Spirit speaks to us, the church. This is our prayer, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, let, me, let me say first and foremost, I feel a lot better than I sound. And um, if you know what has been happening in the past uh, two weeks here, we have been having some challenges and a lot of people are unwell at this time. I am not, uh, I don't have COVID, so I'm fine. And I am really on the mend. But I just want to thank those who have been praying for me and with me. And I want to encourage us to pray for, you know, a number of persons are out because they are not well. And as you know, we have a more mature crowd here at St. Joseph. So we want to encourage persons who are not feeling well to join us online. So today, words from 1 Samuel chapter 3. In verse 10, I'm preaching from the Old Testament today, Mary. <laughs> First Samuel chapter 3, in verse 10. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Speak, for your servant is listening. I speak to you now in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The call of the prophet Samuel is a classic biblical tale. Often perceived as a nice little story, one in which we focus on Samuel's almost naive assumption of a role and a task he knows nothing about. And yet, despite his inexperience and his youthfulness, God calls him anyhow. This call comes within a context that is fraught with doubt and fear, that is laden with absence and some would say silence. To ignore the ominous note in verse 1 that says, The word of the Lord was rare in those days. And visions were not widespread. To ignore that is to bypass the loud silence of God amidst the evil that was present. I believe that this feels familiar to us. Some would argue that we are past the age of miracles, that there is no pillar of fire, there are no columns of smoke, no seas are being parted. In other words, cancer is killing, wars are raging, marriages are falling apart, parents and children are not speaking, white nationalism has come from the underbelly of American culture now to the forefront, and the KKK no longer needs to wear hoods in order to conceal their identity. Political agendas usurp the human agenda of loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. So much so that we have legislated our society into chaos. And there is better access to guns than there is to education and health care. Indeed, it feels like God is silent. But verse 3 says something so powerfully hopeful. It says, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. In spite of the ensuing chaos of the temple, the failed leadership of Eli, the advocacy for monarchy, the restlessness of the Jewish people, the light of God was still managing to break through the darkness. Yes, visions were rare but not extinct. And while Eli and Samuel were both asleep, God was wide awake. I know that based on the start of 2024, 
the expression of a happy new year for us seems elusive. Our community, our church community alone, has experienced nothing but death and tragedy, pain and disappointment. And it seems as if God has been inoculated to our cries for help, our pleas for intervention and success, our desperate need for deliverance. But may I remind you today that God is wide awake. Verse 7 tells us that Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Meaning that where he was spiritually did not afford him the perspective to perceive God's voice. To see God in action. And to bear witness to the message of God. I believe, brothers and sisters, like Samuel, we can sometimes be asleep. We can sometimes be comatose to the presence and the power of God all around us. And like Samuel, we can find ourselves inoculated by God's very voice. Yes, we have had religious instruction. Yes, we have been coming to church for a long time. Yes, we have done confirmation sessions, Christian education exercises, but somehow we have missed the opportunities to go deeper into relationship with God. So like Samuel, we do not know God's voice. And yet still, God calls us by name. Maybe life has left us so exhausted that it has dulled our hearts and our minds and our souls so much so that we have the ability to work in the temple and yet not know the God of the temple. But amidst the distractions and the disappointments, amidst the weariness of our situations and the exhaustion of life, God still calls us by name. Samuel hears God, but does not know the voice of God. And the Bible says he hurries to Eli thinking it was him. And we know the story Eli says, boy, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. You're hearing things. I'm sure we've all heard that before. It's amazing how quick we are to cancel out or explain away spiritual experiences. But the good thing is that God does not stop calling. And so the third time, God calls out to Samuel. And Eli wakes him up, and Eli himself rather wakes up. I believe that it is the first time that Eli had been spiritually awake in years. And he used his spiritual sensibilities to instruct Samuel as to how to respond to God. He says to Samuel, when you hear the voice, say, speak, Lord. For your servant is listening. There are a few things that scream out at me in this exchange. The first one is that spiritual leadership is not purposed to side with our political convictions or connections. But true spiritual leadership is to enable you to say from your heart and with your life, speak Lord. For I am listening. Needless to say, the church, yes, even the Episcopal Church, has sometimes been derailed by the political polarization that saturates our society, where our cause divides us. And I believe that it is the enemy's goal to separate us not only from each other, but to separate us from God. You see, if he can get us to stop speaking to each other, to stop listening to each other, unity and understanding and peace will never be achieved. It is amazing because in this text, an old man and a young man collaborate to hear God's voice 
and to see what God has to say. This is what spiritual leadership does. It helps you to hear what God is saying and it encourages you. In fact, it gives you the tools to respond to God in the appropriate way. And that is why Eli is able to say to Samuel, when you hear his voice again, say, speak for your servant is listening. The second thing that shouts at me from the text is that Eli's sight was failing him, but his vision of God was clear. The truth is that we all struggle with sin, brothers and sisters, in some way, shape, or form. Some sins are more visible and volatile than others. Some are the sins of the heart and the intention. Some are buried deep within us. And yes, the truth of the text is that Eli had failed as a father. He had failed to discipline his sons. He had failed to reprimand them. He had failed to correct them. But God still trusted him with Samuel. Despite his failure in one area, God did not disqualify him in other areas where he could make an impact where he can mentor, where he can guide, where he can mold the life of this young prophetic voice. I think Eli's ministry to Samuel reminds us of the importance of our ministry to those whom God has placed in our midst. It doesn't matter the things that we have done. It doesn't matter the failures that we have incurred. It doesn't matter the ways in which we have not met the mark that God has set. God is faithful and just. He is forgiving and merciful. And he still wants to use us. There is still a place for us in the plan of God. And while we have missed the mark in many areas of our lives, God still has something important for us to do. The final thing that the text says to me is while it only takes heirs to hear God, it takes courage to listen to God. To listen for what God is saying. I can imagine that it was not easy for Samuel to hear the sins of his mentor. It was not easy to know the things that he probably should not have known. It was not easy for him to hear of God's disapproval of someone that he valued and respected. But God often call, calls us to engage and address and to name the things and people closest to us. God calls us to open our eyes to the evil that is around us, to the injustice that is around us, to the violence and the hatred to the bigotry and the collusion of those who represent us or who should represent us. Those who preach to us, those who counsel us, those who advise us. You see, the prophetic function that God gave to Samuel was not just for the nation of Israel, but was for his home. It was for the temple. It means that as God has called us to be his eyes and his ears and his voice. The prophetic function of God upon our lives is not just for the nations, as many tele-evangelists and prophets would make you believe, but rather the prophetic function is for our homes, to get our houses in order. It's for our families to restore healing in our homes. It is for our churches especially for our churches, many of which have become relics and museums of God, rather than a place where God actually lives and breathes and calls and speaks to his people. Most importantly, the prophetic function is for us. It is an opportunity for us to reassess our lives, to see where we have failed, to see where we have gone wrong, to see how we can love more, how we can serve more, how we can help more, how we can be more present in the lives of those whom God has placed in our midst. 
The prophetic function is for us to readjust ourselves, readjust our ears, in tune our hearts, quiet our souls, so that we can listen to God and listen for God. So in this season of struggle, St. Joseph's, as we struggle with so much loss and pain and disappointment, as we begin this year faced with fear and anxiety that have the ability to capture and to hold us hostage, God is speaking in the darkness. God is speaking in the chaos. God is speaking in the grief and in the pain. And even in what appears to be the tragedy of our lives, God is speaking. And this call is an invitation to spiritual intimacy. It is a call for us to join the cause of God, to see God's vision for us, and to speak and to live for God. A wonderful hymn, and my recovering Baptist should know it very well, that is often sung when referencing this text. The words go something like this. Master, speak thy servant Herod, waiting for thy gracious word, longing for that voice that cherith. Master, let it now be heard. I am listening, Lord, for thee. What is thou to say to me? The third stanza says, speak to me by name, O master, and let me know it is to me. Speak that I may follow faster, with a step more firm and free. Where the shepherd leads the flock. In the shadow, the covering of the rock. And the final part of that verse gives our response. It says, Master speak and make me ready. When thy voice is truly heard. With obedience, glad and steady. Still to follow every word. I am Listening, Lord, for thee. Master, speak. Oh, speak to me. We are listening, Lord, for thee. In the midst of our pain, we are listening, Lord, for thee. In the midst of our disappointment, we are listening, Lord. For thee, in the midst of our hurt and our grief, we are listening, Lord, for thee. Master, speak. Oh, speak to us. As God called Samuel in the darkness of the night, in the subtlety of his sleep, in the silence of chaos, God calls us. What is our response? Well, I'll tell you what your response should be. Lord, speak, for we are listening. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And amen. amen.